I think I always had that feeling that there was this, this other world that was bigger and and uh, uh, more real than than the world of our senses or the world that we see every day. Um, and but when it became a search, or, or rather, when it when it became more than just an awareness, but a, 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 a kind of unfulfilled need that I, I was looking for something was um, I guess it must have been I, I, I used to think it was the age of eight but I think it's probably nine um, when um, I, I was just walking back from school one day in Portugal we were living in Portugal and and, and uh, walking through a, a beautiful park um, at the end of a rather long day, and, and you know, I, I should probably say I was trudging home from school, you know, being fairly sort of uh, exhausted at the end of the day. And I suddenly woke up. I mean, literally, it was like that. And and um, I, I I was suddenly I was surrounded by these vivid flowers and everything was incredibly real and I was right there and um, and it was um, yeah literally as if I'd woken up out of a sleep and the way I, I sort of thought about it later uh, is that that uh, my Perception had gone from black and white to technicolor. Yeah, it's, it's it was that's how I could, could explain it to myself as a kid of that age. Was just used to you know watching uh, cartoons in in the cinema. So then I, at that moment I sat, I realized two things. That first of all I thought, well, where was I just now? Mm -hmm. You know, if I'm if I'm here now and I, I'm and and. Uh, and everything's so real, and I'm real. W where was I the last for the last ten minutes, and the last year, and the last how many years? And as I was going back, I suddenly realized, yes, but when I was really small, life was like this, and it just suddenly hit me. I I don't know how I knew that, but I remember. It's as if I remembered. This is how life used to be when I was a little little kid. Mm -hmm. And so, what's happened to me? Why isn't it now? And how can I hold on to this? And of course, I, I couldn't. It gradually evaporated. But I, I knew this is what I want. It's, I want this change. I want to experience life in that, with that power and that uh, uh, immediacy. And, and that's really what set me on my... And I wasn't really aware that I, I, I was looking for it. It was just part, it became part of me. And, and it was a few years before I started finding out that other people had these experiences and that they were real and that they, and, and, and you know, people had talked about them. I, and, and so I guess from that moment I, I was a seeker. I thought I was seeking, but I, I it, you know, this was what happened when I joined Subud. Then I realized uh, in a flash of, of understanding that actually the whole thing was sort of planned for me. And that that the whole thing was a process leading to that moment when I I was opened in in the Latihan, but at the time I thought, my God, you know what's what is it all about? I, it's 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 it seems so the whole thing seems so strange, and the fact that nobody around me seemed to be aware of this that we were living in this sort of uh, twilight world, and that there was a a real world just out of reach. Uh, that, that 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 you know, I couldn't understand why people weren't weren't aware of this and concerned about it, and 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 uh, of course, I I, I I I still don't know. <laughs> I kept reading things, and and in none of it uh, touched on this this mm -hmm. question until I came across the writings of Gurdjieff and Duspensky. And then I thought, this is it. Yeah. I thought, this, these guys have, have know what this what what happened to me on that at that moment, and and then I got really excited, and that I shared with other people. Then, right. I, I you know when when I was uh, 
you know, with school friends and with my mother and and so on. But um, but up to up till then, I didn't know how to talk about it. I didn't know how to express it. But from that moment on, yes. But I was told in my second Latihan that there was this. It's something like this voice that said, "Is this what you were looking for?" And, and so therefore it wasn't me, it was someone else talking to me. I became more and more um, uh, fascinated by, by the teachings of Gurdjieff and Uspensky. And uh, well, I went, I was, when I first came across them, I think I'd probably just gone to, to, to my boarding school in Scotland. And I, when I came across it, it was, you know, I, I used to, uh, you know, devour everything that I could lay my hands on. And in, in those days, you, it, there wasn't a lot to, to, to be found about Gurdjieff's teaching. Um, it, it was kind of considered bizarre by most people, I think. Uh, and it wasn't like now you go into a book, you know, a bookshop and there's, there's dozens of books on it. But I, so I, I sort of, that was my main interest, you know, I was going to classes and passing exams and all that kind of thing, but, but given, you know, 20 minutes, I, I, would, I would, would be reading Gurdjieff and mm -hmm. Uspensky, and sometimes I stayed up all night because, you know, school didn't give you a lot of time to read, and, and um, so then, then there were sort of clues started to come together because, and why? Because my, I could feel my life going more and more into the sort of twilight world, you know. I, 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 I felt more, more and more uh, sort of panicked at the fact that I wasn't, instead of coming back to, to the real world, I was getting further and further away from it. And, and there was a, a sense of, of uh, urgency associated with that. So when I, came to about uh, 16, I found uh, uh, some talks by this guy John Bennett, who, who ran a Gurdjieff group in Kingston. And um, I, I started, uh, someone lent me his talks, and I, I suddenly realized there was a Gurdjieff group in England. And from then on, I, that was my idea, that as soon as I was out of this school business, I would go there and see if I could join a, a group. And then, uh, but then I, I, I saw a, an article in Paris Match about this place, and I mentioned, that mentioned Subud. Mm -hmm. And then I thought, this is very weird, I wonder what this is. But it, it, something, it, it, it kind of, I mean, the, the article was total nonsense. It was about Eva Bartok and all this kind of thing. But there was something behind it. I thought, this, this, I must, th maybe this is the time to investigate what's going on uh, at Coombe. And then I, actually a friend of mine who'd left school a term, uh, two terms before me, went there. Uh, and uh, went there first, who I'd been talking to about Gurdjieff. And he wrote to me about Subud. And, uh, and I re I, something inside me said, this is it, this is That's the thing. That's the call again. That's, yes, I, I, I immediately knew. It was like, so love at first sight, you know. <laughs> and, and I mean, he was very, his letter couldn't have been more terse. I mean, it was like, five lines, it said, I've been here for two weeks, it's totally extraordinary, there's, they're not doing Gurdjieff work anymore, it's something called Subud, I, there's no way I can describe what it is, you'll have to experience it for yourself, uh, so long, <laughs> you know, Timothy Fryer. And, uh, and uh, but I knew the moment I saw the word Subud, I, I knew that this was it. And instantly, Subud wasn't mentioned in the Parimach article, it was that, uh, chaos, that uh, 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 misinformed, you know, it talked about Bennett being a new, a new age Buddha and uh, being in telepathic communication with this Eastern sage called uh, Subu and so on. And, and it all seemed nonsense. But when I saw the word Subu, I thought this is it. And then I was in a state of kind of um, euphoria for a few weeks. Is this before, you before, were, before, before I was open, yeah. 
Yeah. You know, I was sort of open before I was open. Yeah. Coombe Springs was was in a state of chaos, I would say, and you could you could sense that nobody really knew what was going on, and um, uh, you know it was this sort of I, I don't know if Gurdjieff groups tend to be uh, you know they they were. They consist of very, very intense people doing very intense work on themselves. Um, so you can imagine that they weren't sort of um, uh, normal run-of-the-mill people. I mean, there was it, there was a certain atmosphere about about mm -hmm. the Gurdjieff work. Um, and if you you can sort of imagine a you know a bomb going off among uh, people like that. Uh, it was which had kind of totally distorted this this sort of rather rigid world that they they they'd been uh, you know working in or, or or because Gurdjieff work was very top down, very much teacher led, and and you know and 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 was a hard. It wasn't a, a sort of a soft. Um, uh, way it was a hard way, and and um, and you can imagine you know Subud coming into something like this. It, it was um, the impression wa was of of people trying to cope with something they didn't understand, mm -hmm. um, and it 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 and it was strange in many ways. I mean the, the way you know the way people it, because one of Gurdjieff's things was you know you gave people work to do that they that that they were that was completely unfamiliar and would be most likely to bring them out of their comfort zone so you know there were people doing things uh, that they were completely you know that that, that were not you know their 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 thing i, I mean just to give you a, my, my the, my this my lovely friend who I loved so much, June Sori Cookson, who later became Rosiana. Um, I mean, she was the secretary, but you couldn't read her writing. I mean, she hand, <laughs> she hand wrote all her letters, and she was the first person who wrote to me from Coon Springs. But I couldn't read. I, it took me about a week to decipher what she's what she'd written, you know. Yeah. So so it that and that so sort of, that's describes Coombe Springs in a way. It was a sort of rather uh, grey, um, shop-worn, kind of large, rambling house, which wasn't set up to be impressive or comfortable or anything like that, but was a place where people were supposed to have sort of intense inner experiences. Nobody knew what to believe. I mean, nobody could explain what they were doing. And and for me that that is what that and and listening to the Latihan in in the Jami Chunatra made me made me realize that this is this is how this seems real. There's something real here. I'd read all lots of books about yoga and about Buddhism and about theosophy and about this and about that, and and then I'd I'd had been exposed to all sorts of religious people. You know, my mother was very devout Catholic, and she had. Her, she had a friend uh, called Kaplan Fasel, who was the the uh, confessor of Therese Neumann, who the you know the stigmatist, and and they all you know, and they often they sometimes they often but sometimes visited our house, and I listened to them, and I always had this feeling: yes, they're saying things because that's what they have to say, you know. Well, you know, he would say that because that's what they, they, what Catholics believe, and 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 I wanted the real thing. You know, I I I, I didn't I, I I didn't want to have a story. I wanted an access to something that would bring me to reality. <laughs> you know, not not an imaginary reality that I was supposed to to find and believe in, but a real reality that would hit me before I believed in it. <laughs> there was this incredible hum around Coombe that there were dozens of people being opened all the time. I was opened with five other people or four other people, I can't remember exactly. 
and with about f five or six helpers. And then uh, five minutes after the opening started, uh, something like 50 people came into the hall to do Latihan. So it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, it was like, uh, it was full on. Mm -hmm. Second Latihan, I immediately started moving without, you know, I mean, at the moment mm -hmm. of, uh, I started. And, um, and, and so much so that I got quite tired and I was so happy to sink down on my knees after, uh, you know, 10, 15 minutes. And that's when I had this experience when I was back at the age of two. I was, I, 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 could, I could see myself back in Hungary and, um, and, and, and this, had this incredible feeling of vivid reality, uh, of, of being in the here and now and totally um, in that state of, of awareness. Mm -hmm. And then this voice suddenly saying in my head, is this what you were after? Or is this what you wanted? And then I suddenly thought, well, my God, who is, there's, it means there's a power that no, that, that's been watching me all the time, you know, <laughs> all along. And, and, and is sort of orchestrating this and knows much knows me much better than i know myself because i hadn't you know i hadn't talked to anyone about this experience so so i suddenly realized there's a higher intelligence that is a is mm -hmm. you know is is personal has a personal interest in me uh you know it, it this wouldn't convince richard dawkins but it certainly convinced me and uh so to me that that that, that was the key that was the absolute key. So from that, that's why after that, whether the Latihan got unpleasant or boring or, or, or made me sick or it, it didn't matter, I just went on because I knew that it was, it was to do with uh, the most important thing. The person who really impressed me was Shafruddin, because he, Papa had left by then and he left these two Indonesians um, uh, to sort of you know, look after things in the UK. And one was um, Imran, who's now a Sikkin. And, and he was really just a kid. I mean, it was... Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yes, I mean, he was, he, he, he probably was about 21, but he looked like 15 or 14. And he never said anything. <laughs> he, just, he, just, he just smiled. Yeah. And, and the other one was Shafruddin, who, again, he, he just sort of played around, you know. He was... Uh, he, he would make it, tell jokes and and you know and he was learning to play the piano and and so played it rather badly and, and um, but there was something about him um, that I could see okay this is this is Subud mm -hmm. because it was like everything he did was kind of perfect in a funny way the way he moved the way he spoke. And what, what I mean by perfect is it was him. Yeah. Everything was him. Yeah. I'd never been out of Europe. And it was an extraordinary experience for me because obviously I'd, by then I'd been sensitized by the Latihan. Mm -hmm. And it was, a, first of all, of course, the whole, you know, it was another world, you know, it was the tropics and I'd never been in the tropics. And, the, the, you know, that it's always warm and it's always muggy and it's always uh, always mosquitoes and uh, you know all this sort of stuff but there was something else that was extraordinary for me that i suddenly realized i was in a country of people that weren't thinking all the time that they they were they, they 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 lived in the now and this was this was the amazing thing for me it was i suddenly thought this is a completely different way of living from what we have in europe and I remember even asking Papa, does, you know, will Indonesia become like Europe? Because they were, you know, it was all, it was the beginning of the Suharto era where he was opening up the doors of Indonesia to the world. And, and uh, where, because Sukarno had sort of built this sort of fortress around, around Indonesia. And, um, and I suddenly realized, you know, foreign capital was pouring in and so on. And I, I, I said to Papa, is this going to be like Europe eventually with people, you know, rushing on the subway at 9 a.m. to get to work and, and, uh, and rushing here? And, and, he, and Papa said, yeah.
Mm. So I thought, my God, I better go, you know, experience this before before yeah. it's too late. But I never thought of moving there. I really didn't. And it was Papa who suggested it. He came and stayed with us. He, two years later, no, one year later, he he came to London on his next visit, and uh, because he hadn't been to London for a long time, because there had been this confrontation between Indonesia and Malaysia yes, and thereby in UK. Mm -hmm. So he, this was the first visit for many, many years, and um, and he he we couldn't find a place for him to stay. So finally, in the last, I'd been given the job of preparing. I was the head of the committee preparing the visit, and we couldn't find anywhere for him to stay. So finally, Hatati and I decided to hand to give our house for Bapa to stay. Very and, you understand. Oh, sorry. Very symbolic. Yes, rather interesting, isn't it? And but it wasn't. We didn't. It was more of a desperation, anything else. And then, so he was in our house, and he, he, when he, after he arrived, he specially asked us to come and, uh, you know, he was being sort of uh, courteous and and said, you know, you don't have to. We were moving out, and he said, no, no, you can you can stay in the house, mm -hmm. you know, and. Um, and that's when he suddenly said, you know, things have changed in Indonesia now and, and uh, foreigners can work there and three of your friends are starting a company. To, to, uh, you know, I was a civil engineer, so he, starting a company giving engineering, uh, doing engineering consulting and architecture. And he said, you could, you could join them if you, were in, if you wanted to. And that's all he said, you know, he wasn't sort of pushing too hard, but it didn't, I didn't need any pushing. I was so excited. I thought, wow, that would be really amazing. And, uh, and um, so, so that's really, I, I went to experience that, to repeat that experience that I'd had, had uh, the year before, of this, this completely different world, different way of living. And then I found it incredibly difficult. When I decided, when, 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 when I, I, Papa said that, and I, I thought, wow, this is great, let's go. And uh, Hatati cried for a week, uh, you know, at the thought of, of, you know, going to this, you know, far off place, which was, you know, not British, and uh, it wasn't... Uh, it was kind of chaotic, and and she was married to this irresponsible guy who might not, you know, be able to earn a living there, and so on. And but somehow she she you know had the courage to give it a try. And uh, and funnily enough, when I got there, I found it incredibly hard, and she loved it. So it was in the end, it was she who, who, thanks to her, that we we really stayed because right. after. Yeah. A year or two, I thought, this is it, I've had it, you know. Because oh, this thing of living in a place where nobody thinks, uh, you know, <laughs> turned out to be harder than I thought. Especially <laughs> you're a thinker. Yeah, that, absolutely, yeah. yes. I mean, I like everything to be orderly and, and uh, clear and, uh, you know, anyway. I mean, Hatati was absolutely right. I was totally irresponsible. I never thought about practical things, how we would survive there and so on. And it wasn't easy. I mean, I, you know, there was no electricity, there was no water, there was no, uh, no space to live. You know, I mean, really, you, it couldn't be tougher. Um, you know, and you, you perspired nonstop and all that kind of thing. But... Um, and... and, and and then finding that it was very difficult, and I would rather be somewhere else. And, and but, gra Papa gradually beginning to use me for, for you know, interpreting and so on. Which all he all made it look as if it was pure accident. You know, one one night he said, "Oh, you know, I've been talking for an hour, and there are all these foreigners here, and they're not understanding what I'm saying." Uh, um, Sharif, why don't you, uh, you know, say, try, try to see if you can uh, interpret what I've been saying, but just, just the bits you can remember, you know. Okay. Uh, it was like that, you know, and, and I thought, oh yes, okay, and then, and then a few nights later it happened again, and a few nights later it happened again, and it went on for about two years before he said, um, you know, what, what, maybe w would you come with me on, on my next trip? I 
realized that, to my surprise, I was able to interpret um, into English probably better than my predecessors. I mean, I, 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 I'd come to that realization. By then I'd done the, tr the interpreting at the Congress, um, uh, which uh, in, in uh, 71, mm -hmm. when, when there was the, the big Congress in Indonesia. And it went quite well. I mean, I could never understand how I did it. It was, it, it was always a complete mystery to me. But, and I have to say that Usman wasn't a bad interpreter. I, he, he had a remarkable memory. I think probably his memory was better than mine. But the problem was his English, obviously, yeah. you know, and, and, and it's remarkable how good his English was considering where he, you know, his background. Um, really, he'd learned it in Indonesia, and uh, it's amazing, how, you know, how far he could make it go. But uh, I realized that I was, just, you know, a, a, a step better than him because of the fact that I'd, I'd um, you know, I w it wasn't my native language either, but I'd, I'd had my schooling in England, and so, so I, I, and therefore could, people could understand um, me probably better, or, or it was closer to what Bapa was trying to say, probably. Mm -hmm. So I, I just acknowledged that, and and so I, it it seemed lo perfectly logical that he wanted to you know he wanted me to to take over, and I was quite happy to do it. I I, I mean I felt it was a a daunting task because I I was you know quite in awe of Papa, and I, I I never it never got to the point where I I could forget who he was. I don't think we and any of us did. In a way, the delight of working, of being near Baba, which we've all experienced, um, was what kept us all there. I mean, the, you know, there were much more comfortable places to live in the world than than Jakarta in the you know sixties, seventies, and eighties, but. Um, it was this extraordinary uh, delight of being near Baba that kept us there. But, you know, it was also scary because, uh, because of who Baba was. For me, he was a conduit uh, uh, from, from this other world and, and uh, a very big one. I mean, I think in a, in a sense we're all conduits of, of God's power. But you know, there's there's little tiny conduits and and huge conduits. I think he was a huge one. I think probably, you know, I don't know. If it, if it. And it obviously needed that for the Latihan to come into the world. Right. Uh, that's that's how I see it. The question of why me d never really bothered me very much because. Um, many people had, you know, Bapa had had worked with many people um, in the course of his life, and uh, they were not special people uh, in a in a way. You know, they 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 just were willing. That's that's about all you can say about it. So I never got the feeling, oh, I must be special. If Papa is asking me to do it, I must be very special. I I don't I don't didn't have that feeling. Um, which is not to say I'm not special. I hope I am, you know. And, and because we, I, I I think we all are, and I would love to discover my specialness, but um, I'm I'm aware that's not why he. That's not why he, he, he uh, you know, yeah. uh, took me on to do this job. I think he took me on to do this job because I was there and I could do it. That's, that's, that's what I feel. It is true to say that I probably love Papa more than anyone else I've ever met. And if I really ask myself why, 
then it's because I feel he loved me more than anyone else I've ever met. Um, and I mean the real love, which is that he didn't do things that would make me big-headed or that would, you know, you know, it, it was, it, it, you know, I, I could, I mean, looking back now, you know, the sort of wonderful gradualism with which he appointed me to these various roles, um, I could see is, was, you know, he was going out, out of his way to make it, make sure or to do the most he could not to, uh, you know, uh, unbalance my, my yeah. self-image or, or make, you know, or give me a big head or something right. like that. Um, and he was like that in everything. You know, he was incredibly considerate and kind. He launched the bank uh, at the 71 Congress, which was the first time I was officially interpreting for him. And then the, the following year, which was my first round the world trip with Papa, 72, um, really he subordinated everything to getting the bank off the ground, you remember, so everywhere we went, they'd give a talk and Latihan, and then, then, then people would have to come up and sign the book, you know, <laughs> you remember that? <laughs> you know, everybody, I mean, it, nobody ever, you know, I don't know what the SEC would say, but you know, nobody ever launched a bank like that before. <laughs> I knew nothing about business, I, I was an engineer, mm -hmm. damn it, and, and in those days, you, you'd, one of the strange things, because engineering is basically about doing what anyone else can do, but doing it cheaper. Mm -hmm. But in our edu engineering education, they never mentioned money. I mean, it was as if that didn't matter. So in a way, I think the Americans, American engineering education was, in, a, in that sense, much better than British, because in Britain it was more like a profession. Yes, yes. Whereas in America it was about doing things, you know, quicker, better, cheaper. And that was a different view. So. When, when I suddenly, he said to me, you know, I want you to start this construction company, I knew nothing about business whatsoever. I mean, I was a total baby in the wood. And, uh, and, and I wish now I had, because he's, he said, to, I said to him, you know, Papa, I know nothing about business. Could I, if you want me to do this, could I take two years off and go to business school? Which I think one, one of the most intelligent things I've ever said. <laughs> and, but Papa said no. He said, no, there's not time for that. You have to start now. Just get people to help you. And of course, I realize now that he, he didn't realize how, what a complicated world we live in. And, um, and I think if, if only I had done that, it would have, you know, things would have been better for me anyway. Mm -hmm. But I didn't know anything. So we just, we, we, it started from first principles, you know, we, we, we had to, well, first we were a construction company and, and, you know, some of our jobs lost money and some made money and, and uh, it was really difficult, you, you know, because you employed people and they would steal from you and that was normal and, and, and uh, but you didn't know how much they were stealing and whether you could still make a profit and so on. And then uh, finally, um, one day he said, you know, buy this piece of land and, and, and build an office building. So it was really Papa driving the thing. Um, and uh, so we said, how, how do we, you know, we were in Indonesia. I knew, we knew, we were engineers and architects, so we could design it, we could build it. But financing it, we knew nothing. So we said, well, how could we do that? We can't, in other countries, you go to the bank and you get a loan. In Indonesia, you can't do that because the interest is, you know, 25% per annum or something. So forget that. So we thought, well, maybe we can sell uh, square meters of building to Subud members, mm -hmm. you know, and, and they'll get the rent. And, uh, you remember all this yeah, stuff. Yeah. I mean, we invented all that. Yeah, yeah. And I remember talking to a banker later when we finally ran out of, you know, we'd raised seven million dollars from Subud members selling them bits of the building. 
but then there were no more Mosubud members, to, you know. <laughs> and so then we were, we were, by then, of course, we'd built enough of the building that we could start talking to banks. And I remember talking to one banker in Jakarta and he said, you know, we've been watching you guys for the last few years. It's, it's amazing what you're doing. I mean, how did you think of that, you know? Because nobody else did it that way. But, um, so it was, it, we were really flying by the seat of our pants, inventing things as we went along. And of course, you know, we finally we came a cropper because things aren't in business world and things are not static, you know, they always change. Just because it didn't work, just because we crashed, doesn't mean we shouldn't have done it. That's what I'm trying to say. I think because I think it's in the, it's in the trying, it's in the process, it's in the learning that 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 the value is. And Papa always said, uh, if you remember, you know, if you make a mistake, do it again. Yeah, if you may make a mistake, do it again. Do it again. Do it again. And in the end, you will succeed. And, and I think he wasn't saying that as, as a sort of, you know, this is my secret. He was saying, that's how it is, <laughs> you know, not just for you guys, for everybody. And, and of course, we, the one thing we don't like to do is make mistakes. So, so he was saying, go ahead and make mistakes. And, and we sure did. I mean, that's it. But it, that wasn't a bad thing for me. I think it was fine. Yeah. We made the mistakes that we had to make, and and uh, and I, I believe more more than ever that there's no secret to be to to doing business successfully. I think it's it's um, it's in the doing. Yeah. You know? I believe it wasn't about make doing lots of business to make Subud rich, because if Subud was rich, so what? I think it was about learning to do business in a way that is in harmony with our human self, with, our, with, the, with the Latihan, with the Rohani world and all that. So it was actually about changing the way um, people relate to the material. So it, for, for me, that's what it was about. Yeah. And, and I don't think, therefore, you know, if we'd had sort of a more clever financial scheme and, and had, uh, um, you know, made zillions, uh, that, that would have been it. I think the reason we failed was I, I probably we weren't yet able to do it the right way. And I think that will go on until we are. Yeah. And that's kind of difficult because I, nobody knows the answer. I think it's it's a, I mean, look around the world. Um, I think there's a way of doing business that that is humane and 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 or human even. And I think there are people in the world who who are trying to do that and succeeding, but I don't think there yeah, is necessarily super members right now. But I think that's what it's about. It's something like that. I. I I'm groping here, I don't yeah. know. We well, haven't done it yet. I would love it, love to see more people doing the Latihan. I think the Latihan is just such an amazing gift. And it's experienced by so few people. Uh, I mean, it, it, it's some, that really makes me sad. Uh, if, any, if there's anything in Subo that makes me sad, it's that. My project is to try and explain it better and better. I mean, I. I see sort of the extension of my work as Papa's interpreter is to find better and better ways of explaining Subud. Um, you know, I, I occasionally people ask me to talk to, you know, non-Subud people about Subud, and each time I try try out different things, mm -hmm. and and you know, it, it's. And I, I, I wish more people would do that, right. you know, because you, you learn by doing and gradually, you know, people begin to understand what you're trying to say. Now, what I would love to see also is Subud um, succeeding it in, in, in enterprises so that I, I think it's all actually more important than, than anything else because the, Papa always said the charitable must come after the 
after the, uh, the enterprise. And, um, and in a way, I feel if, if the enterprise is right, it contains the charitable within it. Our experience in Lewis is that people come to the Latihan as a result of things we do in the world. That's true. Um, I mean, the, the school and Pelham House have brought in far more people than, than used to come before we did those two things. What is interesting for me is looking around the world, the sort of understanding of what Subodhi is, or the understanding of this possibility of connecting with, with God's power within us as a personal experience, this seems to have um, spread around the world like wildfire. I mean, the, in the 50s, it, it, nobody, nobody, well, it was a completely stupid thing to say. I mean, nobody, uh, people would think you're crazy. Um, now, you know, the bookshelves are, 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 are full of books about, about you know, this, have, having this presence within you and, and living according to that. So you'd think that it would be easier now to, to tell people about Subud. Um, I don't know. I don't know why. Why it's we haven't. You know, it hasn't. We haven't figured it out yet. But but it's it's all in. I'm sure it's all in God's hands. I think if we haven't, it's there's probably a good reason.